nickel, there's all this talk about dirty nickel and clean nickel, right? Um, yeah. But in graphite, they talk about artificial, synthetic, and natural. I mean, is it fair to call artificial and synthetic dirty graphite and natural clean um, graphite? I think some of the artificial graphite makers might have words with you, but I think as, <laughs> as, a, uh, as a broad... Um, Welcome back to Rockstock Channel and thanks for checking in. Before we launch into the interview, we'd like to thank all our Patreon sponsors. And for those of you who are new, share a bit about us. RK Equity is an advisory firm run by Rodney Hooper and me, Howard Klein. We are exclusively focused on raising awareness about companies producing or developing the next generation critical raw materials that are powering Tesla's EV battery energy transition. Please register your email at rkequity.com and follow Rodney and me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Please also subscribe to this channel, Rockstock Channel on YouTube, as well as Lithium Ion Rocks on SoundCloud for our podcasts. Please note, Rodney and me are not financial advisors or broker dealers. Nothing you hear in this video is investment advice. Please do your own research and read the disclaimer at the end of this video or on our website. Thanks again for the support and let's get into the video. Good morning. It is uh, April 1st, and we are here with Matt Fernley, who uh, writes the Battery Materials Review and is also a uh, chief investment officer, I think, at a uh, hedge fund in London called Westbeck. We're going to talk about graphite today. Um, Matt has written this investor guide to graphite and also has a graphite project evaluator. Um, so, is very much an expert in the way Rodney and I have focused a lot on lithium over the years. Um, Matt's going to help us get smart on graphite. RK Equity put together a scoreboard over the last you know few months uh, covering you know similar to a lithium one uh, the various companies in graphite. There are not many there are like zero producers that you could invest in um, in graphite unlike in lithium. So most of the projects here are developers or just early producers um, from Novonix, Nouveau Monde, Syrah, you know, Talga, these are, uh, you know, by market cap and, and, and by location. Every one of these, except for one, is a natural graphite story. Uh, Novonix is the one synthetic graphite play, but the market today, and we're going to talk a lot, Rodney's going to ask some questions on synthetic versus versus natural, but um, Matt, why don't you just like talk to us a little bit just about the graphite investment universe, um, a little bit about your background before that uh, and how you came to, to, to understand battery materials and graphite specifically. Okay, well, my background is uh, going way back. I'm a geochemist. Um, I've been a mining analyst or a mining and materials analyst, I should say these days for 20 odd years. Um, and I'm editor of Battery Materials Review and head of research for Westbeck Capital's Volta Fund, which is a through battery value chain fund. And within Battery Materials Review, it became very clear very early on that there's a lack of understanding in the market of what the key drivers are of a lot of these, um, these days we call them materials, not commodities, but a lot of these materials um, and uh, how they are used for to make batteries for electric vehicles and the supply and demand environments within that. And I think within the battery materials space, I think the least well understood battery material is certainly graphite. Um, and I think the reasons for that is it's a very complex material. Howard, you talked about the difference between artificial graphite and, and natural graphite. I think natural graphite's got different, um, different grades within there. Um, within natural graphite, you then have to upgrade it to a material called uh, spherical graphite um, and then to an anode material to be used in batteries. So there's lots of moving parts in the graphite space, which I think um, investors find it very difficult to get their head around. And I think one of the key issues in the graphite space is that um, it's quite difficult to get access to uh, cost curve data, to benchmark graphite projects globally. So whereas, you know, for lithium or copper, you can buy, easily buy quite low cost cost curves uh, to allow you to benchmark projects with graphite, it's more difficult. And on top of that, because of the complexities of the graphite market, 
Um, I would suggest that a, a plain bottom-up cost curve isn't the best way of, of benchmarking projects. You need to look at more of a margin curve. Um, and obviously that is um, quite a, a complex piece of analysis, which is why not too many suppliers do that. And that's one of the reasons that we actually launched the Graphite Project Evaluator to give a, a low cost um, cost analysis on the graphite space. So yeah, I think the, the graphite is, is quite complex. I mean, we can talk about why that is and the, and the different sort of grades within graphite uh, in a little bit more detail later. But having said that, there's a huge, huge potential for price increases in the space. And there is a huge need for supply growth and, and further investment in the space. Um. On the price increase, another thing that you said, there may not be cost curve data, there's also not price forecast data. So I was asking, you know, you can go to benchmark, you know, for lithium, fast markets, S&P, you know, there's plenty of forecasting out there. A lot of it's inaccurate, but in graphite, there's, there's none. So like when you put together some sort of feasibility study, it's hard to uh, know what, what, what price to use. It's very difficult in graphite. It, 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 it is a very complex material and um, you know, the benchmark prices out there would, would be for a particular particle size and, and probably for a particular carbon level. So we, we took a look at it as uh, TGC, so total uh, graphitic carbon. So you know, if you look at the benchmark price for, for China, it might be for say 100 mesh material and it might be for 96% carbon. Uh, but if your project is producing a different carbon grade and a different size of material, then you're going to take a um, premium or a discount to that. So it gets very uh, complex, a little bit like the iron ore market in, in some ways, apart from the fact that um, the key issue in the graphite space has historically been in terms of the size of your uh, grains of graphite. So historically, your large size grains like super jumbo and jumbo grades will trade at a substantial premium to your smaller size grades. But obviously with the advent of the battery industry now, um, the small and medium sized grains are much more in demand for the battery industry. So potentially they could see um, some price increase. So maybe a closing of that price premium. So it is, it is a difficult it is a difficult uh, material to track and it's also a very difficult material to forecast. And the other issue that's caught a lot of investors out, um, particularly with um, some of the, the new projects that have come into the market over the last two to three years, is that the benchmark prices in China bear no resemblance to the realized prices that a lot of these companies actually managed to attain. So uh, realistically, if you're forecasting prices, you're probably looking at uh, maybe a 20 to 30 percent discount um, to the realized price or the benchmark price for for the company. So that makes it even more complex and, and does impact the the economics of projects. But I, I, I guess going forward, Matt, uh, I mean, the key here and what we're talking about is uh, shifting to you know, the coated uh, spherical graphite for the anode market and, and that surely is going to, depending on, on I guess on the coating etc, but that's surely going to become a more standardized market? Um, I think it's a little bit like the lithium market where you know again you're, you'll maybe have your, your benchmark grade for your coated product but then um, there are there'll be different types of products. I mean, if you look at the, the companies that are developing downstream assets at the moment, um, they're all effectively producing slightly different products with slightly different pricing environments. But I mean, just, to, just as, a, as a basis, artificial graphite is, is the most expensive product. Then it goes down into coated spherical graphite, um, which is a value added product of natural natural product and then obviously you've got flake graphite which is the the um, basis which is probably about trading at the, the highest price uh, products within that will, will trade at about 50 percent of, of spherical graphite prices and then the lower um, the lower quality prices or the smaller size um, 
baskets within that will trade at a, at a substantial discount to, to spherical graphite prices. So, you know, there's, there's lots of moving parts, unfortunately, in the graphite market, which does make it a little bit more difficult to model. But uh, I, I guess the key thing that, that we're looking at and, and no doubt you're focusing on is more the, um, the anode quality material that, uh, you know, that again, it's, it's kind of like everything's popping up all over, you know, where are the pinch points going to come for uh, and bottlenecks going to come for um, the expansion of EV penetration as uh, suddenly we're now seeing, you know, risks to forecast because, you know, the rate of growth of EV penetration is substantially higher than the expansion of all the battery materials. But some of the things I, I was keen to ask you, um, having watched VW's Power Day uh, the other day and some interesting commentary that uh, suddenly I heard synthetic graphite mentioned, you know, in a world that's moving away from fossil fuels, you've suddenly got VW you know, talking about synthetic graphite, which, you know, as needle coke is, you know, made from petroleum. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a big surprise to me, because generally, over the last four or five years, we've actually seen a move away from synthetic graphite. In sort of 2016, 2017, we were looking at probably 60 or 70 percent of, of battery anode supply coming from synthetics. Now, in 2020, we're probably looking at about 50% of the industry coming from synthetics. Um, and, you know, there is a number of drivers behind that. Um, first of all, greater demand. And as I uh, talked about earlier, the greater price of synthetic gra graphite um, and the ability to add new supply, but increasingly also the sustainability. And, and, and I think this is, this is a, a key issue because the manufacturer of synthetic graphite is very power intensive. Um, it's very heat intensive, pressure intensive. So, you know, for starters, you're starting off with a dirty product because it's coming from the petrochemical industry. Then you're putting a whole lot of, of heat and pressure, which obviously is power intensive. And if you're doing the bulk of your manufacturing in China, which is 70% powered by hydrocarbon um, solutions, then, then, then on top of that, the, your, your, adding to your GHG emissions. So yes, you, you do sort of sit there and scratch your head a little bit and, and wonder whether Volkswagen might be going in the wrong direction by, by adopting a, a synthetic graphite uh, or a hundred percent synthetic graphite product, because generally the rest of the industry is moving more towards natural flake. Yeah, that, that's, you know, the way, you know, we've seen it. And, and not only that is if you've got the bulk of synthetic graphite being made in China and the world is moving to more localized supply chains and Europe's raw material alliance is saying, you know, they're looking to have locally um, sourced, a high percentage of locally sourced across the entire battery metal space, then I, I'm not aware of, of uh, any clean synthetic graphite production being planned in Europe. So, well, you know, you know. There, I mean, there are a few projects which are looking to use um, hydroelectric power in the Nordic region to produce um, synthetic graphite, which obviously cuts out on your, your GHG emissions. But the issue is you're still starting with a dirty product. So you're taking a dirty product you're cleaning it and you'll finish up with a, a product that's based on a dirty base. So, you know, that's the issue. And then you contrast that with the, the, the products or, or the projects, I should say, in the Nordic region and in Canada, which are effectively going to mine um, natural flake graphite and then upgrade it using uh, thermal technology, but thermal technology powered by hydroelectric power. So it's, it's effectively clean. Um, and then you contrast that with with a you know an artificial product, uh, graphite product. You are sitting there, sort of wondering why this major company is moving in that direction. If you look at the OEMs and a lot of other companies are looking to themselves become carbon neutral by 2030 or whenever it is. And I've seen estimates, uh, and I don't know if this includes the needle coke portion or not, but looking at roughly five tons tons of CO2 per ton of synthetic graphite you know and we potentially are moving to a hundred dollar a ton or more carbon tax world 
then you're looking at a $500 tax, you know, possibly excluding the needle coke and the transport to wherever it's getting to. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that is substantial as well. And, you know, if you look at the, the projects that are coming on um, globally at the moment or that are being planned in, in the graphite space, um, they would have, they would be much more carbon neutral than, than, than the numbers you're talking about there. So yes, I, I mean, I think one of the key issues in all of the battery materials at the moment is this move to sustainability. We're seeing it through the lithium supply chain, through nickel, um, through manganese, uh, all the way through all of the battery materials. And it just seems very, very strange uh, to talk about adopting 100% artificial graphite when by nature that's a dirty product. V VW um, they said very little about their upstream raw materials, I noticed. Um, a couple of years ago, they indicated they were going to buy their hydroxide from Ganfeng, you know, in China. Uh, so, but they didn't say, they didn't bring that up. They, they brought up their China relationships, you know, for charging. But they've also invested in this battery company, Goshen, right? So Volkswagen has the biggest Chinese presence, I think, of any car company, right? So they have a lot of sensitivities and sensibilities kind of within the country. And if they're buying, I guess they're buying all of their synthetic graphite from China, because that's where it all comes from, right? Um, but they are also making a big bet on solid state, right? So they're, they're in a few years, they think that they're just going to move to solid state. So they, they'll be off graphite altogether. If that happens, do you want to address that? Or you have a more specific question, Rodney on, you know, well, I mean, that... that's an interesting one, because if, if uh, to, my, to my mind, LFP and solid state aren't synonymous. So if they're going for, for LFP, then they're very much in the graphite camp still. Uh, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, I mean, obviously in solid state, in a true solid state battery, you don't have a, a graphite uh, anode, you have a, 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 a lithium metal anode. So, you know, solid state is a, is a level of complexity above uh, where we are at the moment with lithium ion batteries. And, you know, from, for myself, I have material concerns that it's going to take considerably longer to get to solid state. I uh, agree on that. And a lot of uh, commentators suggest. And, and I mean, I think the, the, the other key issue for solid state is it might be viable to do it from a, from a chemical point of view, but is it going to be viable to do it economically um, with the view that obviously lithium metal is quite an expensive product to produce? Um, and also from an, from an LCA, from a life cycle analysis point of view, because again, it's, it's more uh, power intensive to produce lithium metals. So you do have concerns about whether solid state is going to be a viable product for mass market vehicles, or whether we're going to stick with what VW and Tesla have outlined and said, well, LFP for uh, entry level and, and possibly the new NM battery for mass market and maybe solid state for premium vehicles um, where you can absorb a higher cost. Um, so I think, you know, we obviously would look for further detail on that going forward, but I, I, I don't really see solid state being a major chemistry until probably the latter part of this decade. But yeah, sure. I, I think to commercially produce is going to be somewhat tricky, as you've said, you know, to, to mass commercially produce and, and be economic. But I guess just touching back on the graphite again, is there any case for saying that the synthetic graphite uh, produce, you know, products will continue or, or produce a more superior uh, and consistent product that against natural that could justify the argument for using synthetic? I, I mean, that's always been the argument behind synthetic and artificial graphite, that because um, it, it's effectively, um, because of the mode of its manufacture, um, it's more consistent as a material. And, and that, of course, is why artificial graphite trades at, at such a substantial premium to um, spherical graphite manufactured from, from natural, natural products. But of course, the, the other issue is that it's very expensive to make. Um, 
and um, it, it has to, to justify that higher price to, to get a reasonable margin. And, and obviously, as we talked about with regards to the pollution and everything. But I think the key issue on the natural side is that processing um, technologies have improved substantially um, on the natural side. And as a result of that, you're getting much better consistency and much better qualities out of natural uh, or, or anode materials derived from natural materials going forward. And I, I think that with that trend, um, that realistically, I see natural or, or naturally derived uh, graphite being at least 60% of the market going forward um, in lithium ion batteries because of the availability, the greater availability on the supply side. What yeah, is I mean, it today? We, most of the forecasts we've seen are looking at at, at sort of two thirds, one third by twenty thirty. So two thirds natural graphite. Um, Howard, it's yeah. about fifty fifty now today. Uh, it's about fifty fifty. I, I think probably it goes to maybe sixty forty in the next three or four years, and then as you say, two thirds, one third is 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 certainly very viable so and and we've heard the same thing matt in terms of the the quality of product coming out of natural graphite has, has come a long way so i think we would go with that with that shift again just an interesting thought process i, I did feel like when i watched the vw they took the here and now and and also what they're backing so they sort of they went a certain route in terms of 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 how they explained the well just put out rough numbers and then and then didn't dr drill down. But yeah. um, I, I think that's that's an issue. But I mean, if I look at the you know the new projects that are coming out, I mean, Nouveau Mon Graphite have got a, a downstream project. You've got um, Syra have got a downstream project in the US. Ecograph have got interesting downstream technologies. Tauger have got downstream technologies. So there's lots of really interesting downstream projects in anode materials that are coming to the market um, that should be and and also you know people like Nuvo are saying they're going to give you a net zero you, you've got as you know when you buy the product you get a guarantee on the net zero and then the localized production so that's why i'm wondering is you know Tolga to for europe or you know Nuvo mon for for north america and so on i just find it interesting that you would look look to china Yes, I mean, I, I think that's very strange. And I think the, the other thing is there is actually a little bit of synthetic uh, graphite production in Europe um, at the moment. So maybe that's why um, they, they are looking at, at synthetic slash artificial graphite. Um, but I, I, you know, come at, knowing the industry as I do, I'm very surprised to see them going with 100% graphite anode. Um, it seems to buck the trend of, of the other companies that we're seeing in the industry. And what did they talk about battery day on, on the silicon and... Um... Yeah, so, so yeah, Tesla that's... again uh, are another company that, that, that talk about the future a little bit. So he did talk about going to 100% silicon, um, but that's a real, that's a real uh, <laughs> stretch at the moment. I mean, the problem with silicon anodes is that silicon uh, expands significantly when you put an electric current through. Through um, At the moment, the, the high quality graphite anodes are actually combined with up to 10 to 15% silicon, which helps the, the conductive properties of the anode. Um, but realistically, putting more silicon in um, brings you problems with expansion when you put a, a current through and that destabilizes the battery. So um, unless he's got an amazing technology that nobody knows about, I can't see 100% silicon coming anytime soon. My thoughts were rather than silicon being a threat to graphite, I actually think it's a booster because if you're going to, let's say, 15 to 20% silicon doping, and you're getting further tweaks in the cathode, then I think 350, 400 watt hours a kilo energy density is just around the corner. I think you can get there probably in two years, which is well before we see solid state up and running commercially. I mean, to, to tell you the truth, um, we're actually seeing that at the moment. So LFP is obviously a major chemistry in China and, and the big improvements that we've seen in LFP chemistry in the last sort of 12 to 18 months have almost all come from silicon doping. So having a higher amount 
the silicon in the in the graphite anode has actually helped improve that product very very substantially so yeah i i, I don't see you know having 10 percent of your anode taken up by silicon as a negative thing in fact i see it as a positive thing because that's the way that's i agree it, it could boost your market share i think it could actually get the job done as lithium yeah. ion rather than solid state yeah definitely i agree i agree on that in, in nickel, there's all this talk about dirty nickel and clean nickel, right? Um, yeah. But in graphite, they talk about artificial, synthetic, and natural. I mean, is it fair to call artificial and synthetic dirty graphite and natural clean um, graphite? I think some of the artificial graphite makers might have words with you, but I think as, <laughs> as, a, uh, as a broad... Um, Certainly, you know, looking looking from a from an LCA from a life cycle standpoint, um, and, and in terms of the structure of the industry as it is at the moment, with a, a very large proportion coming from China, um, artificial graphite is significantly dirtier than, than than natural graphite. Having said that, most of the natural flake graphite upgrading capacity in the world at the moment is also in China. So really. You know, going forward from a sustainability standpoint, we do need to see the anode material production uh, devolving into Europe and the US or, or, or sorry, North America um, to make it more sustainable. And that's one of the key selling points of a lot of these projects at the moment. That, that, that's so, like a, ver it's a vertically integrated, you know, hard rock to hydroxide, you know, in lithium, you have flake to spherical you know, coated graphite. You know, an anode material, yeah. which is what Nouveau Monde is doing. Is that also what Talga is doing and yes, Syrah I mean, is doing? You know, but it's from Mozambique. You put your anode plant effectively on top of or close to your mining operation. So, you know, you don't have to ship 100,000, 200,000, a million tons a year of, of material around. You, you, you just take it from your, your mining operation to your uh, upgrading plant and and then you 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 know you're shipping quite a small amount of material beyond that uh, and also in North America and in the Nordic region you're benefiting from very low cost and very clean hydroelectric power. Yeah, so I say the guys, if you go all electric mining like Nuvo and then and then do it with hydro, you come out at net you know at net zero. Then. Yeah. So it is it, it is a big difference. Just the last question on my side, uh, Matt is. I'm seeing China get quite a lot stricter around some emissions. They are sort of finally clamping down. Is there any sort of risk that synthetic graphite producers might have tighter environmental scrutiny in the future? I think we're seeing tighter environmental scrutiny in China as a whole, um, not just in graphite, in other materials as well, in rare earths, in... Sure. Um, yes you know, uh, base metals as well. So I think we will continue to see a focus on the space. Uh, we, we saw quite a lot of action from China um, in sort of 2018, 2019, particularly on the graphite space. Um, and I think we will continue to see um, a focus, but realistically, certainly for the next 12, 18 months, two years, China is going to be, um, where most of the synthetic graphite in the world comes from. Uh, and then we're hopeful that the um, new projects in, in the Nordic region and North America can start to come through after that. And hopefully they'll be significantly cleaner with regards to their power sources.